Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Shake Sales. I'm your host, Maggie Bloom, the sales evangelist at Mailshake. And today I'm super, super excited to have Jen Allen Knuth on the show today. She is the community growth manager or director or <laughs> at Lavender. And um, we both love talking about cold email. Jen talks more about the fun side of it and what we'll be talking about today of costs of inaction. And I'm more on the technical side, so I always love to nerd out on Jen's posts, and I always get a ton of great takeaways. But instead of talking about the boring technical stuff today, we're going to be talking about costs of inaction in cold email. But before we do that, Jen, do you mind taking some time to introduce yourself? Yeah, first of all, so excited to be with you. You pronounced my new last name correctly, which is like a first. <laughs> so appreciate that. <laughs> Um, and yeah, so I spent my, actually my entire career I spent as a salesperson in different roles, AM, AE, um, but I always wanted to be on the front line. I spent my career at a company called Corporate Executive Board, which was acquired by Gartner and then spun off our challenger sales methodology division where I was selling sort of big transformational deals to C-level executives, um, primarily at large enterprises. And um, when I left in December, I was intending to kind of go off on my own and then ended up getting stuck right into Lavender, into this role overseeing community partnerships, events, things like that here in the Lavender spot. So that's who I am. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah, you got sucked back in and what a great company to be sucked back into, <laughs> into that type of role. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so you... <laughs> You have a ton of experience with sales, Jen, and that's why I'm excited to talk with you because I love this concept you always talk about of cost of inaction. So I want to, you know, gear it more towards email today. But before we get into that, like, what is cost of inaction and why is it important in the sales cycle? Yeah, so I think many of us, regardless of what we sell, are struggling with the fact that we can have these really powerful ROI stories and customers will look us in the face and they'll say, I know what you have to offer me is better. The debate is no longer about is what you do better. I will agree with you. But I have to be so cost conscious. I We just laid off people. I can't be willy nilly making investments. So even though I might say, yes, I believe your ROI, the ROI is something you get if you do something, right? which usually involves making a purchase cost of inaction is saying, here is the ugly, gnarly, bad thing that's happening right now. And if you choose to do nothing, here's how much that's actually costing you. And so what it goes back to is sort of um, psychology, right? Which is like mm -hmm. when I was planning for my wedding a month ago, six months, I set my alarm for five in the morning to get up to go to the gym. But every day I'd hit it and snooze it and I wouldn't go because it turns out I was okay with my current state. It, I could have been better. I know I could have been better, but every day I woke up and chose status quo. And that's ultimately what we're seeing. And when we're in market conditions like this, that behavior just like grows and grows and grows with our buyers. Yeah, absolutely. And and like you said, it's like that, you know, it's going to be more important highlighting not ROI, but that cost of inaction because it's like, Okay, we always have that example of like selling Zoom during the pandemic. It was like something someone needed, but then after you can't really sell like that same way. You really have to think of like, hey, what's missing from it? And after those different times there, and like you said, kind of that ugly truth of like what they're going to be missing out on if they just stay in the status quo. And this is where I kind of get confused with it because I see sellers do it and then I see sellers doing it without empathy and just like a story that I have from it is my friend's going through the home buying process right now and she's you know working with a loan officer and the loan officer and then she was kind of shopping around as people do with home loans and the per the that the loan officer figured that out and basically was saying like all the all the things that would kind of happen to her if she did that, like if she went with like a bigger lender, it, the house wouldn't close on time, things like that. And so do you ever see it like kind of get taken this way that there's just like a lack of empathy or like lack of understanding in that direction? And like, yeah, like what do you think about that? Like how can we avoid doing that when we want to highlight that cost of inaction? I love that you raise this because I think it's a huge potential pitfall for people who are well-intentioned to try to use cost of an action. So one of the things I'll hear, especially for folks that sell into like the IT 
stakeholder, like CIOs and CISOs and stuff, they're like, if you come in screaming that the house is on fire, you get the door shut right <laughs> in your face. They're not into that type of like, everything's going wrong and I know more than you do. And so you hit on a really good word, which is empathy and tonality. So it is very much in the way that we position it. So often if we think about what we typically write, when we are t talking in a future state benefit-oriented ROI motion, what we're saying is the company will see this, like you will 10 times your revenue or you will whatever the right metric is, right? And it's very yeah. oriented around the company. What we fail to appreciate is we are still selling to an individual human. And that individual human feels a certain pain related to what you are trying to sell them. But by making it so detached from the human, it's very easy for someone to hit delete. And so when I think about the tonality of this message, it's not because you're using the CRM system, you suck and you're never going to sell anything <laughs> because that that just puts a customer on the defense, right? Now my motion is the customer is to, if I do engage, it's I'm going to prove you wrong. And so the way I frame it often is, look, I don't work within your four walls, but I've observed this and this from what I can tell on the outside. And when we see this and this, what often happens is this ugly thing over here. I'm curious, is that something that you're seeing and struggling with? Right? And you can use, I know a lot of people hate the I'm curious thing, so I don't really care. It's not necessary. <laughs> but I think the tonality is like, where I am really curious is like, are you feel, are you as a human being, are you feeling that pain as a byproduct of what's happening over here? And so when you're doing that, you're really focused on the individual human pain that that person is experiencing. So like an easy example for Lavender, right? Like many SDR leaders, they have to read all of these emails all across the week to try to help their SDRs eliminate stuff in it that <coughs> um, hurts the reply rate. So if I can recognize that, acknowledge that and say, what if you could get an hour back every single day, right? Five hours a week, you're not reading emails because you've got a coach in your inbox. That is alleviating pain. And it's not so much about those five hours. It's what they can do with those five hours. So you're struggling to, you know, to wrap your day up at five and see your kiddo or your partner because you've got to go through all these emails. What if you could wrap it up at five? You can go out to dinner. Like, I'm not saying that's all done in an email, but that's the way we should be thinking. If we help them solve for this pain, what does that actually enable them to do? Got it. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, I think like being able to maybe compare it to other people's situations or like, hey, it's okay, but a lot of people struggle with this, I think is like the helpful one because you always see like people on LinkedIn talking about, hey, like you're doing this wrong or, you know, blah, 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 or this is not the way that you should be doing. And it's like, well, if I was someone really struggling and had all this weight on my shoulders and maybe like in the lavender scenario, like you said, and I'm a busy leader and someone tells you like, you're wasting time. And it's like, okay, great. I'm just going to feel bad about myself now too. And I'm not going to talk to Jen about it because I feel bad right now. Like my feeling is that. So yeah, I, I love that. And, and also just highlighting like, this is what you could be doing with that time. So if you weren't in the status quo, um, and talking about co cost of inaction, that that's where it could come from that. So you gave kind of a good example of, you know, some things that you can do with email, but where do you, like, what are some other tips where you can highlight cost of inaction in an email? Yeah, so I think it's, there's a framework that we talk about a lot here at Lavender, which is observation, problem, insight, right? And that's how you form contact. So every one of us has a value prop in our business. And most of us could probably read it off like a script. The problem is we typically lead with it. So if you look at an inbox in any given day for an executive, it's like all of these emails are starting off with either I hope you're well or just checking in or we're the number one at this, but we fail to give someone a reason to care. So I might be the number one whatever in the category, but if I as a prospect don't perceive that I have a pain, it's really kind of irrelevant if you're number one, two, 80. I don't care because I'm not prioritizing yeah. this pain. And so where I really like to use cost of inaction is right after the observation. So the observation is something about them, right? So there was, when I was selling at Challenger, there was a company who was saying, hey, we are losing, like we're waiting way too long and we're way too dependent on winning RFPs. So I need to get my sellers to actually get in earlier before the RFP hits their desk. 
right? So that was something their COO said in a podcast. So I took that and I said, you know, it, Chris spoke about the fact that reps need to get in earlier so that you're winning, depending less on winning RFPs. However, what we tend to see makes that difficult is it's a shift in seller behavior and sellers don't necessarily know what to do in order to create demand versus respond to it. Curious, are you seeing any of that and struggling with it? Right. So you're what you're doing is you're you're taking something very much about them. This is what made me think of you. Then you're eliminating the problem and then you're going to that. Now we don't need to do the full math in the initial email because that's how we get really long emails. But if we think about it, a lot of times we don't get responses in the first one. So the next one is like, hey, I was doing the math with another executive at a different company. They found that they spent, you know, fifty thousand dollars in training workshops. The problem never went away. And so as a result, they're looking at X instead. And so you can start to tell a story. It just doesn't all have to be in that first email, uh, but you can tell a story over time with your calls, with your emails. Yeah, I absolutely love that because I never really thought about it that way. Like, obviously, we always hammer with people of like, keep your email short. And that's what follow ups are for. But it's like, OK, well, what 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 are we actually putting in those follow ups to make them enticing to make people look at them or Maybe it's like their second chance in there. And I like the way you put it. It's like you don't really need to put the how in the first email. Um, and I kind of like to leave that out of my cold emails anyways, because once they respond, that's how we can talk about it. And that's what our discussion is going to be like. But um, yeah, but then also getting a little bit more granular when it comes to what you're saying later on. So exactly. You want to be able to tell a story within it and make sure that you're highlighting that pain. So it comes from there. And since you're the type of person that obviously looks at a lot of emails, so do I, like, and Lavender has some really, really good insights into, you know, what sellers are writing or what works, like, where do you feel like, and especially I love something about Lavender is like that score you give sellers. And I just started using Lavender this week and testing it out. Um, but where are you seeing like, <laughs> where are you seeing reps struggle the most or like getting the lowest score on some of these emails in here? I love this question because when we think about, I'll tell you what it is, and then we think about it, it makes complete sense. And it's almost its own mm -hmm. cost of inaction in and of itself. So yeah. the thing that we see is that 70% of cold emails are written at a 10th grade reading level. Now, that actually might sound low, right? Because most of us went to college and we're taught to write in a really academic fashion. And so our cold emails are where we flex all of our acronyms and our fancy words and our jargon, right? And the problem is we are not keeping the reader in mind when we do that. So I might have the most brilliant analysis of your business and tie back to pain. But what we see is sellers can get really, really lengthy with it. And so we typically have about 10 seconds of a buyer's time or prospect's time when they're opening an email to earn their attention. And if they see that it's a novel, more often than not, the behavior is, I'll come back to it later, and we never do, right, if they don't delete it. So what we found is actually your target should be a third to fifth grade reading level. And the way you get there is no jargon, no like four or five syllable words, no big chunky blocks of text. And when I look at a lot of emails, it is one of the easiest things to spot and fix. It's one of the hardest things when you're writing to remember, because keep in mind, mm -hmm. very few people get trained in their organization when they start in sales to learn how to write in a business setting. So we transfer over that academic style of writing, and then we wonder why it doesn't work when we're trying to get time uninvited in an executive's inbox. So. To me, reading level is one of those really big things because it's actually way harder to write simple than it is to write wordy. Um, so that's what I see a lot. Yeah, well, totally. I mean, you, like the the position of most SCRs, or not most, there's no typical common path to sales, but a lot of just graduated from university are getting into a role where they were used to like writing all the information out, getting a bit more detailed into it. And then the second thing is you get excited or kind of almost nervous as a seller of like, well, if I don't tell them about everything that Lavender does or everything that Malshake does, then, you know, then they're they're not going to know about X. And maybe that's the problem that they deal with. And that's where we kind of went back and talked about it before. That's what the follow up is for. It's like you want to have one idea in that email. And I think the problem is and I wish like somehow we could figure this out 
is like SDRs don't get a lot of prospecting emails. They don't like have that experience themselves of like how overwhelming it can be to just take a look at like a CEO's inbox or a director's inbox or a manager's inbox where it's like, wow, there's a ton of junk in here that I'm not even sifting through and that I don't even have like the capacity to look at. And like you said, it's one of those things where if they do get a long email and maybe something sparked, they're still going to go back to it. And typically when I go back to it, it's already unread and like, I don't go back to it. I don't know about you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't actually, Will Allred, one of our founders did a great, what I thought was a great post yesterday. And he sent, he did a, um, a post where he took the preview text. So the first line of text of all the emails that he received in the last four hours. And then he posted the first lines of all those emails. And it was so illuminating. And I couldn't agree with you more, Maggie. Like what we fail to appreciate a lot of times is SDRs or sellers even are doing the best they can with the information they have. If they've never seen the other messages inside of an executive's inbox, they might look at theirs and say, this is really good. But when you look at yours and you see it has the same patterns as everybody else, all of a sudden that's context. That context allows us to recognize, hey, I need to change my behavior. But without it, it's really hard because at face value, it's not like these emails are, you know, are awful. They're they're what we've been taught to do. It's just not as effective as it used to be. Yeah, absolutely. And and things keep changing. And it's like, yeah, you're just doing the best at what you can. And it's like, you know, you're cold calling, you're sending messages on LinkedIn. It's it's like we have to give them a break of, you know, doing the best that they can. And I mean, I never really want access to my email address when I was an SCR because I would probably vomit. My emails were so bad and like <laughs> rightfully so. Yeah. Yeah. No one ever responded to them. And I was like more on cold calling. And I was like, I guess cold calling works better. And until I got to mail shake and I'm like, oh, great. I get to see emails that are pretty bad here and what I was doing wrong. So and try to help people fix that. But amazing, amazing, Jen. Um, I know this, I always like to keep these episodes kind of short, but, you know, thanks so much for going through that. Because I think it's something really, you know, highlighting that cost of inaction, especially in a time like this, making sure you actually do it with empathy so that you're not just like out there pointing fingers at people, telling people that they do something wrong, I think is something that we all need to hear more of. Because not only are we struggling to write emails, but we're also struggling in a time like this to get attention, write emails, or reach out to people that aren't just going to say, no, I don't have a budget or no, I don't care about ROI. Like, of course they do, but to really dig into pains like that. So I really appreciate you talking about that. And before we finish up, I like to be ask people this question, like what's your favorite sales book that's that's really helped you in your career? Well, I would just be a total loser if I didn't say the one that I worked for forever, um, Challenge of Sales, <laughs> truly changed me. I was 100% a relationship builder. So for those that haven't read it, it um, we studied like 50,000 reps and were able to identify these five different sort of mindsets or profiles of reps and then compare them against performance data. Um, because I started my career in account management, I was way, way in the relationship builder camp. Mm -hmm. And when Challenger came out in 08, 09, when I was selling and struggling, it completely opened my eyes to all the ways I was falling into relationship builder patterns and not at all in Challenger. So truly, truly changed my performance, my my enjoyment in sales too. So that's why I spent so much time there. Thanks so much for, for talking with our audience today, Jen, and you know, just shedding some light on emails. Like I said, the fun side that people don't really hear from me. I hear more about like the back end boring things, but thanks so much for being on and thanks everyone for listening to another episode. We'll catch you next time. Thank you.